Hi. I am John Cohen from Gearbox Publishing. Uh, thank you all very much for coming to this talk. I'm excited to share some research findings and impacts on We Happy Few. Uh, so first, let's talk about goals. All right, so I've got a couple goals today, and I hope you folks have, uh, have some goals with this as well. So today, I'd like to talk first and foremost about the evolution of games user research at Gearbox Publishing over the past couple of years, uh, and how the impact, of becoming a, the impact of becoming a publisher on our team, and our practices, and how we kind of think of ourselves within the context of the team, and how we relate to external developers. Uh, specifically, Compulsion Games with We Happy Few. Latter portion of the talk, we'll uh, turn our attention to We Happy Few and some specific case studies uh, that I'd like to bring about um, to talk about how user research helped inform changes to the game during its development from early access to the final release pro uh, product last August. Uh, so these three case studies are about tutorials, they're about narrative comprehension, and murder. So <laughs> folks, today I hope you walk away from this talk uh, kind of with an understanding that, that success with an external developer like Compulsion Games, a small team, requires great ongoing communication from all sides. That the impacting of one issue with user research, uh, with some findings and discussion and action items, can often lead, uh, lead to the discovery, a surprising discovery even, of another issue. And user research can help design intent and the user's experience become aligned with one another. And finally, that this, re this relationship, this great relationship through communication uh, can produce a fantastic user research experience uh, and environment for the developers and for the user research team. All right, so who am I? I'm John Cohen. Yes, I, I own more than one shirt, I promise. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes I look like this. Uh, uh, our publishing team drew me as a hobbit, which is great. Uh, I've been the user research manager at Gearbox Software since 2012, but in 2015, we moved over to Gearbox Publishing. Um, the, uh, one of the questions for the speaker spotlight was, uh, what is your favorite video game? And mine is Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Uh, and last but not least, I am a major nerd. So ask me anything, I have the button, I promise. That is in fact me at age 13 in a Star Trek uniform on a cruise. And I hope my mother's watching. All right, so. The user research team at Gearbox Publishing consists of three of us. The team is actually seated right here. Uh, so Kyle Beasley, Michelle Garza, and myself. Um, much like everybody else, we have a user research facility, a fantastic space to conduct uh, user tests, and we have a dedicated discussion space. So user research at Gearbox, uh, we do a lot of things. All right? We do usability testing. We do A-B testing. Uh, paper tests, card source, kind of low-tech solutions early on in a project. Uh, we work very closely with the marketing and publishing teams. Uh, to help evaluate potential projects that we may take on in the future. But most importantly, we are a playtesting lab. Uh, that's our bread and butter, that's what we do best. And at Gearbox Publishing, we largely describe playtesting in two broad categories, iterative testing and evaluative testing. So what is iterative testing? This is the kind of testing we do early on in a project that's very focused on a specific feature, set of mechanics, character, map. We are very, very specific with our goals, which teams we speak with, and we typically run controlled studies. This is where the experimentalist in me gets to really breathe and have fun with it, and we talk about controlled variables and groups and what, what conditions we're running. Conversely, evaluative testing comes much later. This is where we look at full playthroughs of a game. Typically, we uh, look at natural gameplay, less constraints, less focused. And sometimes uh, we hire what we call playtest interns. This is a term that we, we colloquially use to describe people that we actually vet and hire and bring aboard as contractors to work with us for a couple of weeks. They kind of temporarily join the team and function as kind of in-depth uh, subject matter experts over the course of a few weeks. So Gearbox Publishing was founded in 2015. Um, Gearbox Software just uh, celebrated our 20th anniversary, but the publishing arm is a little bit newer. Uh, so in 2015, we started publishing some games, and then we published some more, and a few more after that. Uh, and the one we're going to talk about today is We Happy Few. Now, the user research team has experienced some interesting growth and challenges as a function of becoming part of a publishing unit. Now, I know some of you in this room likely work for larger game publishers and game developers that may not see this as much of an issue, but with a team of three, uh, kind of in the process of this evolution, we had to reevaluate a few things. So in 2008, when this department was started, before my time, uh, up through 2015, the principal relationship between user research uh, and, and the rest of the studio was with Gearbox Software. These are people we worked with very closely, right down the hall. Um, we, we were embedded with them, in a sense. Well, ever since 2015, the principal relationship now is with Gearbox Publishing, and through them, external partners, like Compulsion Games. 
All the while, we still need to maintain that relationship with Gearbox software. So it becomes a much more entangled web of how do we prioritize, how do we establish ourselves, how do we view ourselves in the context of this kind of massive beast of a growing studio. So our new role within publishing um, is really user research as a service to an extent. When we, when we talk to external developers, we, we are now presenting ourselves as uh, one part of a kind of publishing package, essentially. We're less part of the team, and we're more part of the publishing unit that comes to them and says, hey, would you like to work with us? Now, on top of that, in the case of Compulsion, we're remote. We're located north of Dallas in Texas, and they're, of course, up in Montreal. So all of this adds to additional complexity and need for communication. So one of those big key takeaways I hope that everybody walks away with is communication is absolutely critical, not just with your internal developing teams, but the external folks. Super critical. So when working with internal folks, you know, we use the term buy-in sometimes uh, you know, within games user research, getting developers to essentially uh, sign off on, hey, we're going to test your content, and uh, we want to work with you about this, so let's, let's all get on board. Buy-in tends to be fairly easy because we see these people every day at Gearbox Software. Walk down the hall, we have meetings with them, have lunch with them, I play board games with them. So it's really easy to get buy off on, on user testing. When we're not talking about external developers located over 2,000 miles away, buy-in can be more difficult. It's not impossible, but it can be more difficult. Mainly because everything takes more time. You can't have impromptu conversations down the hall. You can't stop by while you're having lunch. You need to set aside specific times for Slack conversations you know, and uh, Skype chats uh, and, and meeting discussions Everything takes more time. So what this slide here is, uh, I call this my quarterly call to arms. Uh, every quarter at Gearbox, we have a big quarterly meeting with the whole studio. I'll get up there for a few minutes and, and preach on my soapbox about user research, and I present this slide. This is the call to arms to everybody in our studio, uh, both in Frisco, Texas, and up in Quebec, um, about how they can get involved in user research. This is to galvanize the entire studio behind this process and get them more involved. So we talk about how people can get involved before a test. So help us understand your goals. Help us ask the right questions. Give us some questions and we'll formalize and operationalize those questions for, for the users. So during a test, um, we want you to observe. We want you to comment on the test. Talk to us. You know, we, we use a lot of great technology. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But get involved while the test is happening. And then of course afterwards, please read the reports, please give us feedback, close that feedback loop. Tell us what action items are coming out of the test, and if you decide not to act on something, tell us why. We want to understand that as well. You have a different perspective than us, and there could be a very good reason why you don't want to act on something, and that can help us understand better your process and test differently later. So of course, the whole goal is to help user research better meet everybody's team goals. So that's, that's the, the three minute version. Uh, I, I give a 30 second version for the, the quarterly meetings. But I want to address each of these boxes in more detail when talking about working with an external developer. All right, so relationship goals with compulsion games. So beforehand, what do we need to do? We need to understand from their designers and their producers, some of whom are the same people, it's a small team, it's fantastic, uh, what their goals are for any given test. We need to understand what we can realistically test within a, a time frame that is actionable for them. Right? We've all been in situations where uh, you run a test, you got some great data, you sit in it for a little while, you analyze it, you analyze it, oh shoot, they've already moved past that and it's no longer actionable. If we, if we bite off more than we can chew, we can't realistically deliver something that's actionable. So we need to meet in the middle. And then of course, we need to leave plenty of time for a build to land and sit with QA for a little bit before we test it. Uh, we rely very extensively on our QA teams, both internally at development and our publishing teams, uh, to give us plenty of information, and known issues, and workarounds so that we can run a clean, smooth test as much as possible. Now, during a test, technology has solved a lot of these problems for us because we use Slack, and we have a wonderful uh, streaming tech at the studio where we can pipe out all of our gameplay to people at the studio and abroad. So in this case, uh, technology has, has solved the problem for us and has allowed uh, all of our, our publishing partners and I'm uh, sorry, development partners within publishing and folks at the studio to observe directly uh, in real time and comment to us and ask us plenty of questions while a test is happening. Of course, afterwards, this is where things were really key with Compulsion because they took the time to digest the report and all the data that we presented to them. And we gave them enough time to come up with a list of action items and responses uh, and we typically would sit down with them via Skype for an hour or more, and we would walk through every single report with them, uh, line by line, point by point, and they would explain to us what they thought, 
how they were going to react, if they'd already started moving on that, and if they couldn't or weren't able to, why? Um, and this, this informed us for, for the next test throughout the course of our relationship with them. All right, so this relationship was, went beyond just our two studios. It actually went to the public. Uh, Compulsion Games has been an uh, immensely transparent studio um, throughout the course of We Happy Few's development. And they, would, they were blogging almost weekly, uh, providing journal entries, uh, talking to the public about their development process. And when Gearbox Publishing started a blog on a monthly basis, the user research team decided to follow suit. And we started writing and publishing some uh, lengthy entries about our processes and how we were working closely with Compulsion, because at the time they were our principal partner uh, when we were testing their game. So this was a fantastic way for us to kind of call each other out in very positive ways and explain how we were impacting one another and bring the public in on it. All right, so I've talked about We Happy Few a whole lot, but let's actually dive into what this game is for a moment. All right, so We Happy Few was developed by Compulsion, published by Gearbox in August of 2018. So this is a game, directly from the website, a game of paranoia and survival in a drugged out dystopian English city. So for folks who haven't played it very briefly, it is post-World War II, alternate history, England lost the war. People take a drug called joy to forget all of the horrible things that happened during the war and all of the horrible things that they themselves did. And this, this drug, as the name implies, keeps them all happy. Now, from a gameplay side, this, it's typically referred to as a first-person adventure role-playing game with survival components, crafting mechanics, stealth, combat, and something that they refer to as conformity. In this game, conformity refers to acting in a way that blends in with society. Society has very special rules. And if you don't follow those rules, you can get in trouble, and NPCs can become hostile, and you can have a bad time. So when you conform, you dress properly, given the environment. You interact with NPCs in friendly ways. You offer them flowers or apples. And you don't do things like run around and jump around and act like, well, you know, a normal player character. So all of these features and mechanics uh, were centered on a very heavy focus on narrative and characters. So here we are. And of course, drugs. Drugs that alter your perception, drugs that you know, allow you to blend in and conform, et cetera. So We Happy Few's timeline uh, is an interesting one. So many of you are aware that it was a Kickstarter back in 2015. And after Kickstarter entered into early access for a long period of time, we didn't come on the picture until late 2017. And then the game was published late last year. Now, during early access, players had access to what was called sandbox content. There was no driving narrative. There were a series of missions um, that were played across procedurally generated islands. Now, the tech that Compulsion used to develop this game um, was a procedural generation of environments. The game itself is, connected, is a series of islands connected by bridges. The bridges act as gameplay gates, puzzles you need to solve, things you need to do to get past one area to the next. Well, these islands were procedural, and the missions and objectives would be seeded throughout each one in a very open-world, sandbox, almost roguelike way. Their primary form of feedback at this point was from their community of users during early access. And the people playing this game were the ones typically drawn to kind of open-world survival roguelike games. Well, something started happening as the game began to evolve from the early access sandbox version to what was eventually released last year. The audience began to change, the game began to change, and expectations began to change quite a bit. So we began to shift from a sandbox roguelike to one that was more centered around narrative, characters, and specific acts within the story. These three playable characters, uh, left, from left to right, Arthur, Sally, and Ollie, uh, each had kind of distinct features, strengths, weaknesses, and storylines. So they needed help now with tutorials and onboarding. So when shifting from a, a group of players who want to figure mechanics out on their own, want to go through multiple runs and you know, have success and failure in different ways in, in a, a roguelike, to one where you're looking at appealing to players who want a narrative-driven experience, you need to approach tutorials and onboarding in a different way, in a much more direct or explicit fashion. And of course, they needed to find out who these new players were. And that's where we came in. So let's flash forward. So we wanted to offer them a couple of things. Again, going back to our iterative and evaluative testing uh, procedures. So we told them, hey, look, we can help you understand the individual features of your game. As it's evolving, how are, your, how are these new players interacting with your features? We can help with onboarding. That's what we do really well. First couple of hours of a game with new players, fantastic. On the evaluative side, we can help you understand how the whole game is landing when it's ready. We can give you some in-depth feedback over a long period of time and give you that 30,000 foot view of how it's landing. What did they need? Well, they needed help with tutorials. We'll get into that in just a moment. 
they have a very narrative heavy prologue and it felt very disconnected from the rest of the game at first. So they wanted help linking those two things together. And of course, they also needed some help in, in teaching new mechanics, some of the strangeness of We Happy Few's conformity mechanics and social rules to players. They also needed some help with narrative. They wanted to understand narrative comprehension. Do players actually get what's going on? Do they understand their character's motivations? Because if they don't, if they don't understand the why of what they're doing, the how becomes a bit more muddled. And of course, how this narrative interacts with mechanics. All right, so let's talk about what I call three big wins. All right, these are uh, case studies um, throughout the course of our time with Compulsion Games uh, that look that kind of dive into specific research we did with them, findings, and the impact on the product. So the first one, tutorials. Second one is narrative comprehension. And the third one is murder. So let's first start with tutorials. So to talk about this, we need to flash back to late summer of 2017 with the very first user test we ran for We Happy Few. All right, this, this user test Use the sandbox mode, because that's what was available at the time. Narrative was just coming online, and we were playing with essentially the content that early access users had. We were looking at it through a different lens, a different perspective from a user testing side. So this was one of our iterative tests where we focused on brand new players, never touched the game before. We focused heavily on gameplay and character motivation. This character being Arthur. All right, Arthur is eventually the person you will play first in the full version of the game in kind of act one. So let's walk through the very beginning of the game. Apologies for any spoilers. You start off with a very narrative heavy prologue. You're introduced to some characters. Um, you are found out as someone who is no longer taking this drug. You've rejected it and they then reject you. They chase you out of town. You get knocked unconscious and find your way in what's called the garden district. This is an area on the outskirts of the city uh, where wastrels exist. People who are outcasts and rejects and, and essentially um, the folks that you don't wanna be associated with. And you find your way through a safe zone where you're taught a couple of basic tutorials and breadcrumbing, and you emerge through this hatch from the safe zone and you're dumped into the world at large. This happens over the course of about 15 to 20 minutes. So when you're playing in the sandbox, there are tutorials. You could discover them, but they were not presented in any kind of sequence. So what happens? There's no clear onboarding. Players emerge from this hatch having had a very narrative heavy introduction to the game and they're in this world that's procedurally generated, fairly large, and they can come across any number of missions and tutorials in any order, any sequence. So this creates not just unclear onboarding, but a disconnect between the experience they just had and the one that's really intended. Uh, so I wanna talk about two specific examples of this. So first, crafting a torn suit. So in this game, as I mentioned before, sometimes you need to dress the part. Depending on where you are in the game, you need to wear the right clothing so you don't upset the people around you. And because you're in this garden district full of wastrels, outcasts, you can't be walking around in the fine suit that you normally have. So you need to rip your suit up. Well, how do you do this? Well, you engage in the crafting system. You find a rock and you destroy your suit. You craft a torn suit. Players aren't really told how to do this or why to do this when they emerge in the open world. They're kind of expected to learn this on their own. Fantastic for an open world sandbox roguelike, not so great if you're trying to onboard players into a narrative experience. So players often had trouble with this and they would encounter a number of NPCs who would become hostile to them and they didn't really understand why. And then there's George. George. George is an NPC that players often encounter very early just by virtue of how the environment is procedurally generated around that opening hatch. George is an NPC who is wounded and is asking for help. He wants help from the player to find a number of materials in the environment to craft a bandage for him. Now, this, of course, is an introduction to foraging and crafting, uh, but players look at George, and having had a, a recent combat experience, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, they typically kill George, failing the mission. So what was the solution? Um, Compulsion Games made an elegant and fantastic solution to this. They crafted what they called Tutorial Island, a handcrafted fixed layout space completely different from all of the procedurally generated islands in the game. They essentially created a brand new landmass to function purely for onboarding and tutorialization. And because it was handcrafted and with a fixed layout, they could place the, the tutorials in a fashion that would make sense to new players who are invested in the narrative and the characters. Called Flat Home, it's the first area you encounter in the game. So Tutorial Island was data informed. Uh, they credited us publicly in their blog posts, uh, along with plenty of additional you know, vectors of feedback from developers, early access players, that there was a lot of evidence that they needed to make this decision. 
Uh, and of course, this was, a, this was a hard decision that required production effort. So super kudos to them for doing this. Um, they crafted this island to teach mechanics to onboard the player. Now, this island is also a nice small space so that you're not overwhelmed as a brand new player. You can move around this space, encounter these tutorials. And of course, it serves as a bridge, pun actually intended, to the larger space of the game. Its overall impact, it provided some context for tutorials and onboarding. It helped bootstrap players to the core mechanics and ideas of the game before proceeding into the much larger world. And eventually it led to less confusion, so George often lived. But, but this revealed a fantastic brand new issue, which brings us to the second case study, narrative comprehension. So let's talk about flow for a moment. So the flow of the original game, before Tutorial Island, narrative heavy prologue, enter into the Garden District, Garden District's actually two different islands, so there's two pieces to that. So you get to Garden District 1, and then you move to Garden District 2. Well, Garden District 2 is super important because it is where you come to a location called the train station. Your first big objective in the game is get to the train station. Very, very clear, very explicit. Find your way to the train station. At the train station, you meet this character here, Ollie, first big narrative NPC. Uh, and this is where the story kind of reinforces the core narrative. And it, it reinforces the why of what you were doing in this game. So the players know, gotta get to, gotta get to the train station. It takes a while to get there. So what happens when you add in Tutorial Island? You add another 90 plus minutes between starting the game, emerging from that hatch, and getting to the first big narrative beat. What we found was that pacing and narrative comprehension both took a big hit. Players had a hard time kind of reiterating or um, uh, telling us what the gist of the story was. They couldn't tell us what their character's motivation was. They had a hard time describing what the actual point of the game was. So this, of course, was a big problem because you don't understand the narrative. You can't enjoy it or not enjoy it. So because the narrative picks up at the train station and introduces this key character, it reinforces high-level story and goals. So this was a huge problem for Compulsion. Add them back in there for visual. So what did they do? So fantastic solution again. Credit to Compulsion. They moved the train station. The islands are procedurally generated. The pieces of the islands are procedural, so they bumped the train station back to Garden District number one, decreasing the amount of time it takes to get from the beginning of the game to that first big narrative beat to get that reinvigoration of the story and the motivation of the characters. And what did we find after, do, after they did that? Players had less issue uh, telling us what the motivation of their character was, what the story of the game was, and how all of that intermixed. So ultimately, the impact was better pacing, better comprehension, and better overall engagement. All right, finally, we've come to murder. So we have a lot of different kinds of murder in this game. We have pointy stick murder. We have George murder. We've seen that already. Uh, we have pipe murder. And my favorite is sleepy time murder. That's uh, a player actually smothering an NPC in their sleep. So we noticed a troubling pattern. Um, it was hysterical to watch. We, we observed this from playtest to playtest. Players were essentially murdering their way across the game. This is not what Compulsion intended. Players were approaching this game as a kind of melee bash em up. They were entering people's homes and stealing things and killing them and essentially walking around with weapons in their hands uh, instead of engaging in some of the other systems that were available to them. So Compulsion intended for this game to have a number of different tools in the player's toolbox for solving encounters and scenarios, combat being one of them. Another being stealth or avoidance, essentially avoiding a situation, a problematic situation. And of course, the conformity mechanics, dressing the right way, blending in, avoiding conflict. So before I, I dive into this a little, more, a little deeper, um, I found out last night that Jordan Lynn is not here this year. Uh, so I'm going to bring him here in spirit by channeling something he said uh, at a roundtable discussion at GDC, I believe, three years ago when someone asked really, what is the role of user research? And he very plainly stated that user research is about taking the user's experience and the designer's intent over here with all this noise in the middle and bringing them together and getting rid of the noise. We were experiencing a whole lot of noise, right? A major disconnect between the intention behind the designers and the experience the users were having. So the intent from Compulsion was that, again, conformity, stealth, and combat were fully functional, usable tools throughout the course of the game. But they also intended for each of the main characters that you were playing to have different strengths and weaknesses and for players to kind of gravitate towards one, one play style or another to take advantage of those strengths. So here we have Arthur, Sally, and Ollie. 
Arthur's principal strength is that he's fast. He can avoid situations. Sally is a member of high society, uh, and for a variety of reasons, she has the easiest time conforming to the environment and avoiding conflict that way. Ollie is the strongest of the three characters and uh, essentially is, is a kind of a bullish character, and you can melee your way through just about anything with him. So that's the intent. Well, what did we find? So users experienced very early testing. This is a test with Arthur players. Uh, we see that uh, about half the time our players are favoring a confrontation style, not Arthur's strong suit. And in fact, they were very rarely gravitating towards a stealth or avoidance play style. So not according to Compulsion's desires. Later on, we also ran a test with Arthur and Ollie players, same players, they played both characters. And here we see that combat is overwhelmingly the, the favored play style. Not such a problem for Ollie, a little bit of a problem for Arthur. So why is this the case? This is because early in the game, you encounter a hostile NPC. This is in that safe zone that I described earlier, to get run out of town before you emerge from the hatch. So let's zoom in on your inventory. You're given a lead pipe right here. And the very first NPC you encounter when you have control over your character is hostile and you have a lead pipe. You then emerge from that hatch with a lead pipe. And what did we observe? Well, when all you have is a lead pipe, everybody is a target. And this is where the murder started. So the players were being trained at the beginning of the game inadvertently that this was a combat centric experience. They're told implicitly or otherwise that you solve problems by beating hostile NPCs. If you emerge from that hatch not knowing that you need to conform, destroy your suit, blend in, then you invariably make the NPCs hostile, and when they become hostile, you realize, oh wait, I'm supposed to fight them, and you bash their heads in. So what's the solution? Well, Compulsion decided that they needed to change the player's expectations by elaborating on the tutorials that were present in that tutorial island. So as part of that handcrafted experience, they created a stealth tutorial. In this case, you have to sneak by someone who is urinating against a wall. They also created a conformity tutorial. In this case, you are uh, brought into a church and told exactly how and why to craft that torn suit. So players experience these in, well, they can experience them in different orders. However, each one of them is explicit. And finally, they, they built out a separate combat tutorial later on. So what's the impact? Uh, we got a little bit closer to intent. Not perfect, but closer. So I'll actually unpack these one at a time. So Arthur players, we see after these tutorials were implemented, we found that players were finally gravitating a bit more towards avoidance. They learned how to avoid things. They learned stealth mechanics. With Sally, uh, we saw that players had a very easy time gravitating towards a conformity play style. But of course, combat is still one viable solution. And Ollie, of course, you just murder people. That's fine, that's his intent. Uh, he actually is incapable of conforming for a variety of reasons that I won't spoil for people who wanna play the game. So across these three case studies, we, we built up a relationship with Compulsion, kind of built on, on sharing of data and information and aligning with their intent. And through that, they, they had a whole lot of trust in us. And the real impact of these case studies was that it set us up for some fantastic long-term or long-form user testing later in the project. After we ran these tests with them, we turned our attention to the evaluative side of things, where we helped them understand that 30,000 foot view, but also the kind of in-depth long-term feedback, where we hired what we call playtest interns. So people that we brought on board to play the game and speak with both us, the user research team, as well as members of Compulsion's development team over the course of a two week period. They went through the entire game. They were the first people outside of the dev team to do so. And they provided extensive feedback and in collaboration with Compulsion that helped them fine tune the game and understand how the impact of those early tutorials kind of fed throughout the rest of the experience. And this was made possible because their experiences were better aligned with Compulsion's intent by virtue of the earlier testing that we did. So when you peel back that initial layer of tutorial feedback and onboarding, you know, whether you call it an onion parfait or an ogre, you can get to the deeper levels of feedback. And our early testing gave us that opportunity. So ultimately, this led to success. All right, this model of engaging them before a playtest, during a playtest, and afterwards uh, through feedback and, and action items actually closed that loop. So in closing, um, I believe that we absolutely met the challenges of, of becoming a publisher and working with a publishing team and an external development team. 
Uh, and I hope that these takeaways are clear that, that our ongoing communication efforts led to some great success with Compulsion and We Happy Few. Um, impacting one, you know, one aspect of We Happy Few, namely tutorials and Tutorial Island, led to the discovery of a new issue which we were able to help tackle with more user research, in this case, the narrative comprehension issue. Uh, we were able to help their, their design intent better align with the user's experience and vice versa, in the case of making people less murdery. And finally, this relationship uh, is, has been a fantastic one. In fact, it continues to this day as we continue to work with them on DLC for We Happy Few. So I want to thank a lot of people. Um, first and foremost, Compulsion Games and then Gearbox Software and Publishing, the user research team who are here with me today, our QA marketing PR teams, the project teams, and legal, and of course, everybody here at the summit. And I'm happy to take plenty of questions. Thank you all very much.